Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, before we get going, just a, a friendly reminder here, we're all together on Zoom here in this meeting at the Vermont Climate Council um, in one big meeting room. Um, if, uh, if you're not uh, a member of the Climate Council or an invited guest who's helping us with today's meeting, we ask that you keep your camera turned off until we do public comment, just as a way of helping folks um, <clears throat> uh, clean up the screen uh, here on the Zoom room. And the same thing for chat. We welcome members of the public to use the chat during the public comment period. Um, and we ask you hold off from doing that uh, while the Climate Council is having its meeting. Uh, my name is David Plum. My role is just to help facilitate. Let me turn it over to your chair, uh, Secretary Clauser, um, to kick us off today. Secretary. Thanks, David. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will just quickly run through the agenda, which should be in your chat, is also online, and then hand it back over to uh, David to run us through the rest of the meeting. So we'll start with review and approval of minutes and then move into a just transition reflection. After which um, Jane will take us through an update on legislative testimony process and we'll review a draft report to the legislature. At 1140, we'll have council self-evaluation and reflection followed by a break. We'll return at 1240 for, to review and um, discuss the draft land acknowledgement. We'll move into updates from subcommittees and then finally end with um, a review of the draft work plan for the coming year. And then as always at the end, we'll have an opportunity for public comment before we adjourn at two o'clock. Any changes or concerns with the agenda? Okay, David, I hand it back to you. Thanks. Great. Okay, super. Thanks, Kristen. Um, all right, so that's our agenda. We've got a couple important things to do today for sure. It's good to be back together. Um, and um, so if folks are comfortable with today's agenda, which appears you are, let's do the housekeeping piece, which is the review and approval of our minutes. Um, and we they're posted as a link in the agenda as usual. So feel free to take a moment and click through that. Um, I'll give folks a moment. And while folks are doing that, while it is the 24th of January, I believe this is the first time we've come together, right? Unless I'm missing something. So happy January, happy 2022. It's good to be back together. I think all of us needed some breathing space from the hecticness of what we did before going into the this year. And so uh, today's a great day to take that breath. And we're going to be talking about evaluation. We're going to be talking about a work plan. Um, and so we really can sort of feel what it means to work together this year uh, in today's meeting. Okay, um, review, review and approval of December 21 minutes. Any concerns or anyone need more time for that? Okay, great. Let's consider those approved. Um, thanks everyone. Now, as we often or always do, we like to start our meetings with a just transitions reflection. And today we've invited um, someone from the other side of the country. Um, and it's curious, other side of the country and originally from the other side of the pond, if I understand correctly, Wendy. Um, and I'm actually gonna let, um, you know, this came from Secretary Moore uh, and reached out uh, to Wendy uh, Bruin de Bruin. I apologize, Wendy, if I'm not getting your last names perfectly, but I think it's pronounced Bruin de Bruin, if I'm, I'm correct. Yeah. Is that close? That's, that's, that's exactly how I'm using it. Correct. Great. Thanks. Thank Perhaps you. we were in, in the Netherlands, we'd say it a little differently, but that's true. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I, I wonder, Secretary Moore, if you can just say a word about um, how Wendy came to your attention before we turn it over to Wendy in a presentation we've asked uh, her to do. So Julie, if you can just say a word or two, um, how, we, how we came to Wendy. Yes, 
I would be happy to. Um, and Wendy, it's a pleasure to, to see you on the screen. So I'd actually come across an article uh, that Wendy had written about uh, ways to improve communications around climate, acts, climate action, and in particular, um, word choice and how important it is in trying to convey messages. And this is as I was doing work, trying to think about we, we often talk about mitigation, adaptation, resilience, and, and just an awareness that these words don't resonate very well with the broad public. Um, and it happened across an article which I had shared with ANR's communications director, Elo Casey, who then followed up with Wandi to see what, what we could glean from their research, um, what we might consider incorporating into our own outreach and engagement materials. And I'm just thrilled she's able to join us this morning and share more about her work. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So Wendy, let me turn it over to you. Um, we've got about 20 minutes here for some presentation from you, any conversation on the back end of that. Um, and we're really pleased you've been able to, to join us and, and help us with this conversation. Great. Uh, let me share my screen. Yep. And start at the beginning instead of in the middle like we have here. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so what I'll do today is I'll, I'll um, uh, give you some uh, three insights from social science research for improving climate change communications. And I hope you, you will find those helpful. And then we'll have a Q&A at the end um, in case anything was not clear. Um, so um, um, like um, uh, you heard, my name is Wendy Bruin de Bruin. Uh, I'm a provost professor of public policy, psychology, and behavioral science at the University of Southern California. And my expertise is in the social science of science communication. And today I'm joined by uh, two of my USC colleagues that you'll also see uh, on the screen. Um, Kate Weber is the director of the USC Dornsai Public Exchange. And her office helps academics at USC to work with organizations in the private and public sector. And for example, her office has supported a project in which we helped the United Nations Foundation and the IPCC to improve their climate change communications. And I'm also joined by uh, Lance Ignan, and he is the USC Dornsai Senior Associate Dean for Strategic Initiative and Communications. And he is a communications expert who has worked in the past uh, as a consultant for the United Nations Foundation, the IPCC, and other organizations to improve their climate change communications. And Kate and Lance will join us in the Q&A as well. Okay, so as you are probably well aware, climate change is expected to bring impacts uh, around the world and including to Vermont. And according to the Vermont Action Plan, uh, Vermont is facing, among other things, more rainfall and flooding, changes to agriculture, including shifts in growing season lengths, and changes in forests. And I took this directly from the uh, Vermont Action Plan. Now, climate change, of course, requires behavior change. And when climate scientists talk about behavior change that is needed in the context of climate change, there are basically two types of behavior change that, that come up. The first one is often referred to by climate experts as mitigation. And that means reducing emissions from transportation, buildings, and energy products. And the second type of behavior change that is needed in the context of climate change is called adaptation. And that means protect, protecting people and uh, infrastructure from uh, expected climate impacts. And social scientists can help to promote behavior change because um, we have training in how to communicate about risk, including climate change, and how to promote behavior change, including mitigation and adaptation behaviors. And so I'm gonna give you three insights that come from social science research that I hope you find useful for your climate change communications and maybe communications in general. So the first one is to think about who is your audience and what do they need to know? And in the context of climate change, I think that means thinking harder about the motivated majority because we're now finding that in the United States and around the world, uh, people are reporting a majority of people is reporting a concern about climate change. But if you look at climate change communications, they're often not written for the majority that is already concerned about climate change. A lot of climate change communications that I see out there are actually instead addressing the minority that is not concerned about climate change. So climate change communications spend a lot of effort on 
convincing people that climate change is happening, but then often they overlook the majority that is already convinced that climate change is happening. And addressing that motivated majority is important because they don't necessarily know what to do about climate change. Um, so for example, we've done uh, studies, uh, surveys in the United States where we ask people, what's the best thing you can do to reduce the carbon footprint of your home energy use? And by far the most common answer that people gave was to turn off the lights. And anecdotally, I know a lot of families that fight about who left the lights on, who was the last person in the room and left the lights on. And I see some of you smiling. I think you probably have the experience as well. It's very common. But turning off the lights is not necessarily the best thing you can do in your home to reduce your home energy use. Um, um, in, this, uh, in fact, in most households, um, the best thing you can do to reduce the carbon footprint of your home energy use is to blast the air conditioner less in the summer. Um, and even people who are concerned about climate change are often not aware of that. Similarly, we've done surveys where we ask people, what is the best thing you can do to reduce the carbon footprint of your food choices? And we find that by far the most common answer is that people worry about waste. And um, anecdotally, I've heard a lot of uh, people who are concerned about climate change complaining about having had to get more takeout during the pandemic instead of eating out, for example. And that takeout comes with a lot of packaging. And of course, it's a good idea to reduce packaging and to try to reduce reuse and recycle. But the best thing you can do to reduce the carbon footprint of your food choices is to eat less meat. And I'm not saying that we should all go vegan, although if we did, that would make a big difference. <laughs> but look, um, um, switching from red meat to white meat or to plant-based products, even just a couple of days a week can make a big difference be um, because um, eating less meat reduces diet carbon footprint a lot more than reducing waste. And so the motivated majority, people who wanna do something about climate change often don't know these things. And so that's something to focus on. A second point I wanna make is that it's important to make communications understandable. Um, so we find that, for example, that um, uh, uh, education is, is correlated to reporting climate change concerns. So people with a college education tend to be more likely to report climate change concerns than people with a high school education and people with up to an elementary school education. And the reason for that is probably because climate change communications can be difficult to understand. If you um, look at communications from the IPCC and other organizations, it, they are often written at the university level and they use complex words such as mitigation and adaptation, which I used in my presentation today, um, but I explained them, right? Uh, uh, and, um, but they also use words like um, uh, carbon neutral, sustainable development, carbon dioxide removal, and so on. And those are not words that are common in everyday language. And uh, Lance, Kate and I recently completed a, a project in which we interviewed people from across the United States who varied in their concerns about climate change. And we found that even people who are concerned about climate change can often be confused about climate change terminology. So for example, when we ask people to uh, uh, define mitigation, they often confuse it with mediation or uh, resolving a conflict. And when we ask people to, identify, um, to define adaptation, they said things like turning a book into a movie, which is of course an adaptation, but that is not what adaptation means in the climate context. And then other confusion, that we found to our surprise is that sustainable development, a lot of people thought that meant sustainable real estate. So they confused development with real estate. Um, and so um, um, we have some recommendations for making climate change communications easier to understand. And um, so the first recommendation is use everyday language without jargon. And of course, uh, that sounds like a good recommendation, but often uh, when you have expertise in a particular domain, you may not even realize you're using jargon because if you're familiar with a domain, the words don't feel like jargon to you, they are very meaningful to you. 
So uh, that's why we also have a second recommendation or a follow-up recommendation that is to use short words and short sentences. Um, shorter words tend to be more common in everyday language and uh, lead to less confusion. Words that are three syllables or more are uh, less commonly known, but also more likely to be jargon. Um, generally, the literature on the science of science communication suggests writing your text at the seventh grade reading level. And I realize Vermont is a very educated state and uh, most people in Vermont probably have an education beyond seventh grade, but um, uh, writing text at the seventh grade reading level doesn't just make the text easier to read for people with lower levels of education. In fact, people with higher levels of education also find text easier to understand if it's written at the seventh grade reading level. Now, I've, I've, in my experience, when I recommend uh, writing at the seventh grade reading level, there, there are always some experts who are uh, hesitant to do that because they don't want to talk down to people and they don't want to, um, you know, they, they say, we're not writing Sesame Street stories, we're writing about climate change. But the thing is, climate change is very complex. If you can write about it in very simple language, you just make it so much easier to understand. Um, and then the third advice for making communications understandable is to provide examples. So don't just uh, explain what words like mitigation and adaptation mean, but also give an example of what people can actually do. Because as I showed on my earlier slides, even people who are concerned about climate change do not necessarily know the best way, the best things they can do to reduce uh, their uh, carbon footprint. And then the third piece of advice that we have is to be concrete. And this is perhaps especially important when uh, communicating about climate change adaptation or preparing for uh, climate impacts. Um, so um, uh, what we find is that concerns about severe weather tend to be unrelated to education. So you don't need a college education to understand that, for example, flooding has become more of a concern in your area. Whereas you may need, where we, uh, we do find that college education is associated with more climate change concerns. Um, we've also done surveys in a flood prone area in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we found that Republicans and Democrats in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania did not disagree, or they agreed, let's say, to say that they, Democrats and Republicans agreed that flooding had become more of a concern in their area, but they disagreed about whether, whether or not it was climate change. So um, a lot of um, um, municipalities, especially more Republican leaning ones, have started to refer to climate change adaptation actions as a flood action plan instead of a climate change adaptation plan because it's easier to rally people behind flood action plans, the concrete issue, than climate change adaptation plans, which is more abstract, so harder to understand, and easy, e um, more prone to political polarization. So something to think about. So three pieces of advice. Think about who your audience is. And in, in the context of climate change, I think it's especially important to address the motivated majority and they're often overlooked. Second, make communications understandable. So write in everyday language and avoid technical terms. And third, be concrete. In the context of climate change, that might mean linking climate change to severe local weather events that people have already observed and are concerned about. And then finally, social scientists can help. Um, we're not climate scientists, but social scientists have training in uh, testing communications to see which ones are more understandable and more uh, compelling to different audiences. Yeah. And um, so our USC team is willing to help and we're here for questions. Thank you. Andy, thank you so much. Very, very interesting and pertinent, particularly as we are thinking about increased engagement around the climate action plan that this group pulled together last year. So we have time uh, to ask Wendy and her team um, and her colleagues uh, questions about this and how it could be particularly applicable to us. Um, Secretary Moore, go ahead, please. 
I'm just interested if, if there are jurisdictions, states, municipalities, what have you, that you feel are particularly, have been particularly sec successful in how they've communicated uh, climate action, the need for climate action to their, their community members. Um, I actually have, have not seen such a detailed action plan as Vermont. So I'm not really sure uh, that uh, I think maybe you're the leaders. Thanks for the yeah. Uh, Secretary Tevitz. Uh, good morning. Um, as you advocate for um, Americans moving away from um, animal, uh, animal agriculture, what, what do you suggest we do with the land um, and, and the income of those farmers? That, that is an excellent question. Now I should say I'm a social scientist and so I don't have the expertise to make that recommendation. Um, so doing something about climate change requires a team of people in different areas of expertise. So I think um, um, uh, uh, we would need um, to, we would need uh, different uh, uh, scientists, environmental scientists to be involved with this. And I think maybe uh, involving the farmers in this communication is uh, uh, this, this decision making is also important. But I think in your, slot, in your, your communication slide, you advocated for moving away from, you know, meat as much meat. Right. So uh, the, the well, that's that's if if we want to reduce our carbon footprints, then that's something that needs to be done. Uh, but you might you don't make those decisions in isolation, right? And so um, that's a that's a, that's a decision making process. You would need experts in different domains, including the farmers. Uh, to, you, you would need to involve them to decide together what is the best way forward. Lance, this is something you wanted yeah. to add? If I could offer a suggestion, um, I used to work for Impossible Foods. And as, as you may know, they produce plant-based foods and they want to eliminate animal agriculture. Um, but they also have, are very sensitive to what animal uh, the animal agriculture industry, what, what will happen to it if, if indeed plant-based foods become more predominant. And I believe they have a program uh, for how to make that transition so that um, the people who work in that industry are, uh, can still make a living because um, they're, very, they're very concerned and cognizant of that, of that shift, uh, albeit taking, taking place very slowly, gradually. Um, and they have some, some tremendous scientists and experts working on that. So even though they might look like an enemy to, to animal farmers, uh, they're actually not. And I can put you in touch with someone there if you like. Might I suggest on, on this issue, it feels like that was put out as an example of showing how the things that we think are helpful aren't always the most helpful. Uh, and it's not that you all are suggesting that you have a plan for how to do climate action in Vermont. You're saying you should be cognizant about the fact that folks actually don't know what the most helpful things can be. Um, right. And that is an example that you brought. But again, Vermont has its action plan about the types of things that it think will make the most difference in Vermont. Yeah. Awesome. Catherine? Thanks for a great presentation. I always thought if I had a different career, it would be a social scientist. So thanks, Julie, for bringing <laughs> these folks here. Um, I um, was especially interested in the concept that you talked about a lot about the motivated majority and how we spend, I think appropriately, a lot of time wringing our hands about how to bring in the people who aren't part of that motivated majority. And I'm wondering if you could speak to a little bit about how to balance the communication goals um, by wanting to capture that motivated majority, but not leave behind the ones who aren't quite in there yet. Right. So yeah, I'm not advocating to leave anybody behind, but I think currently- I didn't think that you were, but <laughs> at all. <laughs> Currently, a lot of climate change communications are leaving the majority behind. And I think that's, that's, a, that's an oversight. And uh, so thinking about 
um, uh, and so it can, can of course be difficult when you have different different um, audiences. But so spending appropriate time on how uh, what what impacts climate change is having locally, so yeah. that people can see, yes, I have I've experienced that because unfortunately we're we're now so far into climate change. In the past, it was difficult to communicate about climate change because people didn't think it would happen. But now, even people who are not so sure that it's climate change, they are seeing the impacts. And they do agree we need to do something about the impact. So it's, it's uh, in terms of um, uh, communicate, communicating about preparation that should make your job a lot easier. <laughs> the, the mitigation part may be difficult, right? Convincing people to, do, to curb emissions. Um, so, um, so, the, so involving the minority in adaptation communication should be relatively easy because it means preparing for extreme impacts and extreme weather events that people are, tend to agree are already happening, no matter what side of the political aisle they're on. Um, and then for mitigation action, um, I, I think this is generally a good idea, even when addressing the m m majority, uh, I think picking um, those actions that have more benefits, not just uh, uh, curb uh, um, emissions, but can also have other benefits um, um, uh, and, and highlighting what those benefits are can be really useful. So for example, um, uh, we have found in our work that uh, um, there are um, Republicans who don't like the idea of reliance of foreign oil. And so switching, switching um, for that reason um, uh, is also important. And so highlighting that in your communications is important. And so thinking about, when you think about how to do that, um, one thing uh, to, that, that, that we often do in our communications is to involve people from the different audiences in the development of the communication so that it's a, uh, so the, the communication, even though your action plan is, you know, goes out there, and once it's out there, it's a one-way communication. You can develop it in a way as if it's a two-way communication, right? So you develop it together with members of tar um, um, members of your target audience, so that the communication addresses the concerns of the different target audiences before your plan goes out there, so that uh, people from different audiences have said, yes, we are on board with this communication. It's written in a way that we find understandable and compelling, and it addresses our concerns. Kate, did you want to add something? Yeah, please. I, I did. Thank you, Wendy. Um, on the subject of, of tools to develop communications, I wondered if you might say um, just a, a little bit about the readability index tool. You showed the, the link, um, but I, I think this group might find that an interesting tool. I personally, before we did this study, did not know that existed. Um, and so... Thanks for the reminder. I put the link on my slides and I'll share my slides, but uh, it's a good thing that you say this. So there is a, there's an online tool where you can copy and paste your text into it and it will tell you the reading comprehension uh, level needed to understand your text. And the recommendation is to write in everyday language and uh, everyday language uh, is, is, is usually at the seventh grade level. And so you can copy and paste your text into that tool. It will tell you what the reading level is. If it's higher than, if it's a lot higher than seven, you can make your text um, easier to understand by replacing longer words with shorter words and making your sent sentences shorter. Um, this tool is also available, not uh, um, uh, um, uh, it's available as part of Microsoft Word, but not all versions. Um, so that's why I have a link to this online tool as well, so everybody can use it. And I will share my slides so um, you can use this link. Super. Thanks, Wendy. Um, June, last question, please. Yeah, thank you so much. This was a fascinating presentation. Um, Wendy, I think I understood that you're at USC right now in Southern California, but you're from the Netherlands. That's correct. I wonder if in your research you can speak at all to the particular challenges posed by multilingual um, communications. And also, because in the United States, we certainly have that challenge. And also whether your, your research or your peers' research speaks to what I'm gonna call multicultural experiences. I, I, I grew up in Germany, but I'm actually from Southern California originally. 
Um, and so I'm very aware that what, what, what is dominant culture, if you will, in Southern California, where there is no such thing, is very different from what's in Kansas or what's in Texas or what's in Vermont. Right. And I'm not sure that that same um, facet is replicates itself in the Netherlands, but it certainly um, is present if you think about the European Union. So I, I realize I'm not being very specific here, but I'm just wondering if you could speak a moment to the challenges posed by the lingual and cultural differences, especially where something like meat is concerned. Yeah, um, no, yeah. So that's that's a that's a um, a really good point. And we we have worked. Our team has worked with the IPCC, and the IPCC does international climate change communications, right? And they they made even though they make the communications available in multiple languages, the main communications are available in English. And um, uh, at least at first. And so um, uh, the, um, that's another reason why it's so important to write at, in, in very simple English because there are people for whom English is not the first language and that will also help them. Um, but if there is a concern within Vermont or wherever you're communicating, clearly you're communicating in Vermont, thinking about the key audiences of your communications doesn't just mean involving people from um, different political backgrounds. It might also need to include people with different professions who are affected by climate change, as well as people from different communities who might have different um, ethnic backgrounds. Involve um, members from those communities in your action plan and in your communications um, that will help to make sure that the communication is understandable, compelling, and culturally appropriate for, for the different audiences you have in mind. And this is a recommendation that is often implemented in patient communications, right? So in the context of health, we also study communications. And in for patient communications, it's, uh, it's often the case that there is like a patient panel that informs the design of communication so that um, the patient can say, no, you know, you should say it this way, otherwise we wouldn't, we wouldn't respond or I mean, people in my community wouldn't respond. And so that might be an idea to also um, implement for uh, designing uh, climate change communications. One last word. Um, do you have any thoughts on the relative effectiveness of imagery versus language? Because you've spoken repeatedly about seventh grade level communication yes. in terms of language, but what about images? Yeah, so so it is a, a, a common intuition that uh, images will, uh, that a picture is worth a thousand words, right? But, but it really depends on the picture. So a lot of, if you, if you look at uh, climate change communications from, um, from climate science, from organizations of climate scientists, they tend to use uh, graphs and, and uh, that are really difficult to understand. Um, and so they're not helpful. We find that even international policymakers may struggle to understand those. And these are people who have expertise in climate change, or at least they work in climate policy. So yes, images can help, but the images should be very clearly designed, have, a very, have, a, have one single message uh, and, um, and, and then it, it's also helpful that if you have a, a graph or an image to, to have uh, a sentence next to it that, uh, that explains its key message because not everybody is good at understanding graphs and images. And so uh, having, a, uh, having words next to it as well that explain the key message can be really helpful. Yeah, I was thinking about too that we had here in the States in the seventies, one was the litter bug campaign where it just literally showed a little bug flying around saying, don't be a litter bug because every little bit hurts. Here I am 58 years old, I still remember it. And the other is the food pyramid that I think the FDA had for a very long time, which I gather is the subject of controversy, but it was a very powerful uh, stay in our communication in this level for a very long time. These are things that occurred to me when you were talking about air conditioning and meat. I don't want to take us off track, but I've enjoyed this presentation enormously. And thank you and your colleagues for your fine work. Thank you so much. I hope you, will you found it helpful. We're very happy to answer more questions. Feel free to email um, us. And uh, I also, if, if it's helpful, I can also share a graph design checklist 
that we've developed um, 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 after doing uh, interviews with different audiences who are, who are interpreting climate graphs. So if you're planning to use graphs in your communications, I can, I can share that and I think that you'll find it helpful. Please, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. All right, folks, thanks so much, uh, Wendy and colleagues for joining us this morning. It's kind of frustrating to have it be so short. Uh, and it was very helpful. Um, so thanks so much for that. And I bet you will get some reach out from members of this council for some follow up and Great. your offer for the graphs piece. Absolutely. So I see some applauding and thanks happening. So many thanks again. Thanks so much. Looking forward to hearing from you. All right. Great. So um, let's keep rolling forward uh, with what we're doing um, Jane was going to help um, give a quick update on what's going on in the legislature in terms of the testimony that's being provided and also a report that you all as a council uh, should sign off on that's going to the legislature. So Jane, let me turn it over to you uh, for, for this. Thanks, David. Um, I'm going to be brief um, and then um, specifically around legislative testimony and hope that other counselors who have been actively engaged in providing testimony will feel free to follow up on anything that I bring up um, and we can have a few minutes of conversation. And then I'll um, hope to pivot from that to turn your attention to the report that was shared last week with you all that was due to the General Assembly on January 15th um, and is required by the GWSA. We did um, submit a placeholder um, with the General Assembly a week ago, letting them know um, that the report was drafted in more detail and would be provided to them after this meeting and your approval. So first and foremost, there's lots of action in the legislature. I'll just say we've been invited into um, numerous committees in both the Senate and House um, to provide overviews of um, the Climate Action Plan and been using the presentation that um, Climate Access provided and we've since tailored a bit um, specific to providing an overview of the Climate Action Plan. Um, when invited, um, there had, was a process that the steering committee discussed and that I used to help guide who I made sure um, was tapped to come and join with myself or Secretary Moore who have largely been delivering the overviews. Um, and as um, presentations were asked um, at a broad level um, by Senate committees or House committees, I've invited um, the Senate representatives on the steering committee to join when there was a Senate committee hearing and the House appointments um, to join when and where there were House testimonies provided. And when there were um, committees of jurisdiction that were looking to dive deeper into specific um, topics um, associated with your subcommittee work, we've invited the co-chairs to join with us. And I just want to pause there and just say that's been the process at a high level that the steering committee recommended. And I think there was um, some tension around that um, for a while about any like confusion about um, where and when people should be testifying. But of course, everybody is um, joined to testify um, when asked to come in and speak. It's wonderful to have diversity of people going in to testify in the Climate Action Plan specific issues. And the only um, really sort of takeaway from the process that the steering committee discussed was really around just being clear um, about who you're speaking for when um, you go into committee. You can always walk and into I think that really as the mm -hmm. climate action plan summaries are sort of drawing to an end. We have one more this week um, with Senate agriculture that I sort of thought after a quiet week last week that we were sort of done with overviews. Um, but then Senate agriculture reached out to me last week and I tapped um, the representatives Lauren and Jared to join me as the counselors who sit on the steering committee appointed by the Senate and then also had um, turned their attention to Abby and Billy and um, who co-chair Ag and Eco and suggested that if they plan to go deeper into any of the sections of the that part of the climate action plan that Billy and Abby would be um, logical next steps to invite in as well. So beyond the climate action plan summaries, um, there are many issues being taken up by the legislature, and I hope that all of you will lean in and speak up about some of the ones you know about, but the clean heat standard is getting a lot of attention. 
There was a new bill last week introduced on ag soil mitigation. That was exciting. There's a fuel switching bill. There's changes to UVA, um, Act 250. There's a Transportation Innovation Act. There's really a lot of action within the legislature, and it will be interesting over the next few weeks as things settle down to really see what gets traction. Um, and really hope that others here who have been um, providing the technical expertise on any of these bills um, can speak up and um, contribute what they know about what's happening now as well. Because hopefully as the council gets into a groove this year, we can ensure that we provide regular updates on legislative testimony as happens. So I'll pause there before I shift because I would like to make sure we provide a space to talk about the report as um, we need to hopefully move forward with approving that today or any comments you'd like to see before we do so. Great. Thanks, Jane. So if others who have testified just want to say anything around the dynamics of that to complement Jane's uh, overview there, this is a great time. Otherwise, we'll shift gears and talk about this report that uh, needs to get approved um, uh, by you all. So any folks who have been testifying that need to supplement what Jane said in this overview. Great. I see Sue Minter in the chat, just acknowledging she's testified around just transitions. Great. Okay. All right, if there's nothing else around what's going on in terms of that testimony, um, Jane, the, you sent around a report last week. It's a um, sort of mandated report that um, needs to be sent in on the council's activities. Do you wanna say a word about that? Yeah, just briefly, um, this is the second of such report. Um, there was one provided last year as well. They're due on an annual basis uh, to the General Assembly as required by the GWSA. And it's an overview report of um, the activities and work that the council took on for the year. Of course, I just wanted to be like, you know, see climate action plan and sort of punt another report. Um, but the report itself tries to summarize some of the key um, objectives and work of the council, both around process and technical analysis and contractual services. Um, so the report is brief, but has a lot of hyperlinks in it, hopefully making it for ease of access for legislators to actually um, find the summaries and work that they want to turn their attention to. So um, I sent it around. The steering committee has reviewed it. Um, edits and changes were made based on feedback from the steering committee. Um, and the report is now in front of you all to approve as it is being submitted on the council's behalf. So. If there are any lingering comments or questions about how the work is being reflected, now would be a good time to raise them and hopefully we can move to approve it. Great. Liz, go ahead, please. Thanks, Jane, and thanks for um, putting this together. And, and uh, we discussed it at the steering committee a little bit, and I'm glad to hear we'll have a chance to talk about it now. Um, I did have only one concern, it's on the very last page in the edits to the final paragraph that were made. Um, I can send it in chat and see if others agree, but it's the middle sentence of the last paragraph, which as drafted, I think the legislature might find the um, tone slightly off because it says if the legislature fails to act. And I think there you know, just are, are better ways to say that. Um, so I'll send a suggestion in chat and if others agree, great. If they don't, then it wouldn't cause me to vote against it. I just think it would be an improvement. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Thank you, Liz. I wonder, um, Jane, if you, we, I can, I'll pull it up right now. I have it uh, open. I, I have it, I can share it if you'd like. And yeah. Liz, I appreciate if you have a suggested sentence right now that folks would have um, moved to approve, happy to take that up in the chat. And obviously, this was the area of um, discussion, I, I should say, that the steering committee focused on these last two paragraphs. Um, and Jared and Liz were kind enough to work with me to rewrite these two paragraphs based on the feedback that we heard um, from the steering committee. And that one, that sentence that Liz you're referring to was actually an addition um, that we put back in. So I appreciate that you're catching um, 
this detention and if you have language that gets at the gist of that but is clear and not and getting at the right tone I appreciate seeing that and um, tweaking it and this just gets at that balance and tension appreciating that um, the climate action plan really is sort of handed back to the legislature and tries to draw attention to the fact that we need the legislature to act in relatively short order in order to not move back into more broad rulemaking for the Agency of Natural Resources, which we believe would be challenging for Vermonters more so than the legislative actions. Okay. Liz, were you going to drop something in the chat? Oh, you're working on it. Okay, that's great. Okay. Are there, while she's doing that, are there any other, up oh, I see, others to speak up, any other comments? Mm -hmm. I put in two versions. The first just removes the tone of the phrase, but I think the second, which is the full sentence rewrite, gets more at what you're trying to achieve. I think, I think your point is that ANR has limited capacity uh, under current rulemaking to make the types of changes that would be required to meet emissions reductions and so it will be more consequential, and I think you mean consequential and difficult for Vermonters if the legislature does not enact further programs and expansions to programs. And if that's what you mean, then the suggestion that I put in chat is designed to get there. Thanks. Secretary Moore, I know this is yeah, important for you. I just clarify, Liz, Liz said the word capacity, and I, I guess I, I, it's not relative to the agency's capacity, not to say that that's not an issue, but I, I think your second rewrite, Liz, very much gets at it, is that the requirements will Authority. be difficult and consequential. Um, and, and I think this conveys the, the message that, that I believe strongly needs to be brought back to the legislature. Okay, great. So um, there's, Liz puts a suggestion in the chat for specific language. I see some support for it. Um, it. Julie Moore just said, yep, gets at my concern. I can see June's in there saying, yep, that looks good. Um, and Jared's also supporting. Does anybody have concerns swapping out that sentence and what Liz is proposing? Again, it's swapping out a sentence that right now starts with the resulting regulatory action. Then we have concerns with that. Yeah, that one that uh, Jane's highlighting right now. Great, I'm seeing support for it in the chat. I'm not seeing any concerns about it. I'm seeing some thumbs up from Chris Campany, thanks. Okay, so let's swap that out um, using Liz's language. Is there anything else you wanna flag up about this report before it gets sent over? Because I think what we need to do is actually do a formal, yep, let's send it. So before we do that, um, anything else that people want to raise up from this uh, this report? Just a quick question. <clears throat> I assume that we're doing a cover letter with this as well. And it seems to me that the discussion we just had uh, could benefit from being highlighted in that cover letter. Great, June. I don't know, Jane, is, is that the way you guys do that? not actually seen it sent with a cover letter, just a um, overview referencing the due date and the statutory requirement as I've seen the, our general counsel shared with me the legislative report requirements and it's pretty brief with the report attached via email. Yeah, there's gonna be some sort of transmittal and it's an opportunity that shouldn't be lost since the point is so important. And for what it's worth, every single report my agency sends has either a cover letter or an email that says, dear legislators, here it is. So let's not miss the opportunity. Great, so a specific suggestion to send uh, a cover letter that highlights this point that we're talking about right now in Liz's language. Rich? I, I like the, uh, the draft. I like the suggestion that June just made. Um, and I would suggest that witnesses who are going to be speaking to legislative committees about the work of the council also keep this point in mind. I, I recognize that we're asking the legislature to do quite a lot in the, in the coming session. And yet, um, as this report notes, if they don't do take action, 
then it, it, we either just are going to blow off meeting the GWSA um, emission reduction requirements and other requirements for that matter. Um, or the ANR is going to be involved in some really complex rulemaking endeavors. And that message needs to be communicated really clearly, and it probably has to be communicated multiple times. Thanks, Rich. That's really helpful. Okay, anything else before we officially give this a stop? Okay. So uh, what I just need to confirm for that everybody's okay with sending this report to the legislature, including Liz's uh, sentence as a swapped out sentence in that final paragraph and having a cover note that also highlights that point um, when it gets sent. Um, I see both Leslie Ann and Catherine are picking up typos and things. Um, and uh, thank you for that. Um, any concerns now from all of you to send on to the legislature with those changes that we've just discussed? Any final concerns? Okay. So thanks folks. That's you as a council saying, yep, please send it along Jane um, on our behalf. Okay, great. Thanks folks. All right, um, that brings us to the next piece, um, which was a request from you all as a council to say, we really should take stock of um, what happened in 2021 with an eye towards thinking about some changes about how we function in 2022. And that even though your role and your responsibilities this year are quite different than what they were last year in developing a plan, um, and yet it's important to take stock and think about its implications. We sent out a survey, uh, Jane and Marion sent out a survey last week uh, or even earlier, um, and that survey is still open, but we have some preliminary results from about, um, Marion and Jane will have to tell me how many. It was open not only to counselors, but also to subcommittee members and key staff. Uh, and so we got a diversity of, represent of folks responding and it still is open for another uh, week or two. So these are preliminary results. The way we wanted to handle this conversation is, thanks Marion, 19 responses so far, is Marion's compiled from these preliminary results, some initial voices and ideas and key themes emerging. Again, highlight the word initial. So Marion's gonna walk us through that. Then we're actually gonna try something a little different for us where Cameron set up some groups of four counselors, five counselors, and we're gonna get into some smaller groups and just talk about this for a little bit. We think this is one of these topics that is best dealt with just conversation in smaller groups. For those of you observing our meetings today, you'll have the option to just drop in and listen in on those small group conversations as well. Um, so we'll do that for a little bit, and then we'll come back and have a few words in plenary um, and talk about anything jumping out. So let's start this by turning to Marion. Um, and Marion, if you want to walk us through some of these initial themes and ideas that you saw um, emerging from these responses. Certainly. Thanks, David, for the introduction. Um, and hopefully you all can see my screen here. I will note that this presentation is also saved on the event page for today's um, today's meeting, and I would recommend folks take a look at that as I'm not gonna read every single response that's in here, but I do hope you all reference that and, and keep these responses in mind as we break into small groups um, later today, later in this meeting. Um, so as David said, we Jane and I um, and David worked on this um, survey. Um, it was made up of just four questions, um, hoping that counselors, state staff, and subcommittee members would take the time to reflect on the process it took to stand up the Climate Council, stand up subcommittees and develop the Climate Action Plan in 2021 and that we can use these responses and results to um, really figure out how we can improve our process moving into 2022 and beyond. Um, 
I do just wanna take a second to thank everyone who took the time to respond to this survey. I know for a lot of folks, um, it, it caused a lot of reflection on what has been a really um, uh, challenging but rewarding year. And I hope that folks found it useful to, res to um, respond to the survey and, and will be able to make use of these results. So as David said, we've had 19 responses thus far, but a reminder that the survey will be open for another two weeks. And we hope to then share all of the results once we close the survey. Um, and I think Jane or I can share the, the link again to the survey after this meeting uh, with counselors and state staff support and subcommittee members so folks can, can fill out that survey if you haven't already. Um, we had, you'll see on the screen here, eight climate counselors who've responded to the survey, four members of subcommittees who were not climate counselors, and then seven state of Vermont uh, support staff who were working with various um, subcommittees. So what I'm gonna do is just, um, uh, or what we did to develop this initial uh, summary of responses was comb through them and assign uh, key themes to specific statements pulled out of each of the responses that you all submitted. So you'll see on the slides here for each of the four questions that we'll walk through a couple of key themes. And these are, um, again, we developed a, about 15 or so key themes that really get at the, the basis of the thought or the statement uh, that came through that you all responded to, and I think will help us frame up how we make improvements moving forward. And then I just took a couple of um, selections of responses for each of the questions here, hoping to highlight counselors, subcommittee members, and state support staff, um, as well as the various themes that come through in the responses. So the first question um, was around what worked well this past year, and how can we perhaps build on that, and how did that help um, the development of the Climate Action Plan? And again, I'm not going to read through each responses, but the three highlighted here, there were a number of folks reflecting on how wonderful it was and how great it was uh, to see the development of the guiding principles and how um, there's a lot of hope for those uh, to be used moving forward for both the council and state work. Um, a lot of reflection on the effective facilitation um, and how that was really critical to the process, uh, particularly bringing in, in outside facilitators and then a lot of appreciation for the diversity of the various subcommittees and that that led to some really hard but important conversations. And so key themes for, again, this reflection on what was positive um, over the development of the Climate Action Plan and the work we did in 2021, covered contractor support, um, the development of the guiding principles with a focus on equity, and then the state staff support and subcommittee membership. So moving on to the second question, uh, this was really asking folks to reflect on if you could change a couple of things about the process in 2021, what would those be? Key themes that stood out here was reflections on trust within the council and in subcommittees as well, reflections on equity and how voices were or were not lifted up in this process, the process to actually write the climate action plan, and then a focus on decision making both at the subcommittee and council level. So you'll see uh, reflected here, there was a reflection on um, a, a request or a hope that we could have spent a bit more time doing some visioning at the subcommittee level, an ask that we set more clear guidelines around our decision making and that um, uh, sort of consensus voting versus up and down voting um, uh, within the process, and then also a lack of coordination and process at times um, across and between subcommittees. And we saw these uh, come up as themes within responses to this question quite a bit. Just because we did receive quite a bit of thoughts um, and, and really detailed feedback for this particular question, another slide highlighting some of those themes there uh, was asking for state staff um, and asking that those could have brought in, that those resources could have brought in, uh, been brought in earlier into the process. And then also some thought and reflection on coalition building and really um, uh, seeing a, a pervasive power dynamic in the council and really reflecting on how that impacted the trust within councillors and subcommittees. The next question was asking folks to reflect on what they wrote in the previous question. So the process in 2021 um, and how that could change the way that we work in 2022. So a number of reflection points here. Uh, the first one thinking about um, the process of having the council approve everything and perhaps we could start thinking about some more autonomy for the subcommittees, continuing and, and expanding our partnerships with other entities outside of uh, the current sphere of work and using those engagements and partnerships for implementation. Thinking about how we should be intentional about our use of the guiding principles and a specific request to put out a revised plan at the end of this year. And then also a reflection on workload and an ask to reduce the number of meetings um, that we all attend this year. 
And just a continuation there, I um, mean, you'll see the key themes highlighted here. A lot of reflection on workload, public engagement, membership of council and subcommittees, as well as a couple pieces of reflection on financial compensation and how folks yes. um, are compensated for their work on the council. I'll leave this here for just a moment. You can see there's, um, again, a reflection on maintaining a unity of purpose. Um, it also focused on trust, um, an effort to break down those silos across subcommittees, taking the time that we have now to think about our policy ideas and proposals and work with frontline communities. Um, and then also a reflection on more technical support specifically, specifically for climate resilience and sequestration efforts. And then moving on to our last question um, was just a broad open end question about other components of the council's work that we asked folks to reflect on, reflect on that could help shape our efforts this year. Key themes here that stood out was again, the focus on trust um, within the council and subcommittees, a focus on implementation, state staff support, and then workload as well. So again, a reflection on workload and how there, there's a hope that we can slow down and have a bit more time to listen and process an understanding and, and asking for an understanding of the resources that are available to the council. And then again, a reflection on trust within council members um, that came across in a number of meetings. So that is it for an overview. Again, this is linked on our website. Um, as David highlighted, um, the survey will be open for another two weeks and then we're hoping to share a broader summary of the results with all of you, um, but hoping this acts as a good starting off point for a conversation in our small groups. Thanks, David. I'm on mute, sorry. Okay, so um, like I said, this is one of these things where it'd be great if we were in person, it would be lovely if we were just talking to each other. We're gonna try to replicate as much of that sort of conversational aspect to this by doing small groups. Um, Cameron has set up some groups that tries to mix uh, counselors in different ways. We can't guarantee a perfect mix, um, but we've set up about four or five groups uh, that Cameron can launch in just a second. Um, and then those who are not council members can, can literally like click on a group and join uh, as an observer in a, in a, in, as we do this. We really only have about 15 minutes to do this in small groups. Um, and even that's gonna be a little tight, but let's go ahead and, and invest 15 minutes to have this conversation in small groups. And what's the conversation? In my mind, I'm gonna drop this in the chat. I think I would recommend that we really get our heads into what does all this mean for our work this year? And if it's important to, to go back into 2021 and say, this is an experience I had last year that was you know, positive or deeply troubling. And that's why I'm making this recommendation about how we work this year. That's great. And I wanna be pulling this into the present as well to say, we have opportunities to learn from how we worked together last year. So I encourage you to pull it into, what does this mean for our work this year together? Um, and I'll be jumping around the rooms and making sure folks are, are okay. Before we go and do this, let me just do a quick pause. Does anybody feel like we need a little more guidance before we drop into some small groups? Any questions folks have about what we're about to ask you to do in groups of four or five? Any questions? Okay, then. Um, Yes. So let's do this. Uh, Cameron, if you can go ahead and uh, go ahead and drop counselors into their rooms. Um, the rest of us will stay behind uh, for the moment. And Cameron, folks are jumping into their rooms. Everybody else who's left here, can you explain to folks how they could choose to just jump into a, a breakout room to observe what's happening? Sure thing. So everybody on your Zoom screen, um, at the bottom, you should see an option that says breakout rooms. And in that, you click it, and you should have the option to join one of the four breakout rooms that are on there. It'll just say next to the room, join. And you just click on that, and it'll drop right in. 
if you have any trouble getting into the room and you just rather us randomly pick one for you, we can assign you. But if you want to self-select, that is the way to do it. And let me know if that's not completely clear, but just let me know. Great. And if you want to just stay here for 15 minutes and wait for everybody to get back, that's great too. Um, so uh, feel free to join a room. Um, Cam, I'm just going to go jumping around rooms. If I get lost, can you <laughs> help me get back? I should be able to move around freely, right? Um, I think actually you need to be made a co-host, which I don't think you are right now. So Jane, can you make him a co-host? And while Jane does that, I'm going to just pause this recording because we're not going to be discussing in plenary right now. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we ripped them back. Okay. All right. That was probably an unexpectedly abrupt return for a bunch of folks. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine several of you were in the middle of a conversation or you're hoping to hear from someone else in your group who you hadn't actually heard from yet. So um, I apologize for the abruptness of that. I wonder if it left a taste in your mouth, though it actually is kind of good to sit down and have some smaller group conversations. And we can maybe bake that into some of our work going forward a little bit more if that feels like a good use of time. Um, and, and again, apologies for tearing you out of those somewhat abruptly. Um, what we wanted to do, um, yeah, and if you did take notes, yeah, send those up to, to um, <coughs> Jane or Marianne or myself and, and we'll consolidate, that's great. I think what I'd love to do just in a kind of 10 minute version of this is to say, you know, really now thinking about this year, like, are there things that are kind of no brainers for this year that reflect what we learned last year and how we work together and we really want to do it differently this year or we want to do something that we were, we were doing we want to make sure we continue it so let me just check in with folks again this is just a quick shout out from all of you um what's what's something that really should be done this year given the reflection you just had any quick thoughts on that let's do it a little bit here in plenary um, and before we take a break, what's something that really needs to happen this year that we as a council can do either differently or continue from last year, but something that really needs to happen based on what you were just all talking about in your groups? Leslie Ann, please go ahead. Hang on one second. Oh, there we go. Yep. Thanks, David. I think one of the things that uh, for me personally has come out is um, we really need to get to know each other as we step on forward and continue to work together. Um, I think we've sort of been forced into this um, a little bit artificial environment where we sit and just voice stuff. And I think in a lot of the groups that I work with really well, it's because we know each other. We um, you know a little bit about each other, you know how to support each other. And I think we haven't had that time and space to develop that cohesiveness as a group. And so a lot of this sort of like, moving forward piece is is not there yet because we are still eh, somewhat strangers and I think to the extent that we could maybe set aside more time like we just had that's not recorded that just allows you to sort of like share would be super awesome because it then sets up a different kind of dynamic in how we interact with each other and share expertise and share knowledge so I just wanted to offer that um, by way of helping to support each one of us self-care wise but also as a council self-care wise. Thanks so much, Leslie Ann. Thanks so much. Erica? Thanks. Uh, one of the, the comments I made in our group was, um, I think, you know, we were uh, trying to chase a moving target a little bit uh, last year. And um, especially as it relates to what the deliverable needed to look like. Um, we knew what the del deliverable was, but you know, the target being what the deliverable needed to look like was uh, did move throughout the year. And as a subcommittee co-chair, it was really difficult to um, prioritize tasks for a subcommittee um, and direct where uh, what the you know where folks needed to go to get things accomplished. Um, and it, and it le led to a lot of uh, a lot of hurry up and get it done work at the very end, um, which 
I think we, if we are very intentional about the goals that the council has for this year and the next year, and what that translates in terms of how it needs, what needs to, what it needs to look like, what the deliverable is, what the deliverable contains, we can um, we can manage our workload a little bit more. Uh, so I would really urge the council to do a little bit of work planning. Um, and be really clear about what the expectations we have for ourselves as well as our subcommittees. Thanks, Erica. That's really great. Okay, so those are two specific ideas. Um, and again, maybe it's not so specifically formed, but it's something you're gestating. Uh, feel free to share. We've got a few more minutes here. Um, things that we can do this year that pull on the learning from last year. Anything else that came up in your groups that's important to put out there right now? Bram? So, uh, you know, in our group also uh, consistent with, uh, with what Leslie Ann said, um, that the, uh, and, and the two related topics of trust and communication, uh, which is to say we would work uh, better and more effectively and more productively if we uh, had an opportunity to build more trust with each other. And um, similarly, we would probably work more effectively if, uh, and communicating better is somewhat based on uh, more trust, but uh, communication among the subcommittees in particular was called out and something that we could do a, a better job of going forward. Thanks, Bram. June? Um, I think I'm speaking for my group and they will let me know if I'm not. Uh, one was um, there was some thought that Counselor time needs to be treated as a precious resource. It needs to be used more sparingly and more in a more targeted way. This implies that there needs to be something done about the level of compensation or the like at the subcommittee level. If the actual work, the reflection, the planning, the thinking of the council is to be done at that level with decisional um, time by the council members when we meet as a group less frequently, but therefore for decisional purposes. Secondly, um, it was very easy to forget that there are many people on this council and even more people probably in subcommittees who have very little experience doing this kind of work. And we're just sort of thrown into the ring and learning how to do this, how to function as a member of a deliberative body um, and hoping to you know, achieve some measure of comfort and acumen before uh, the you know, the big show went live with uh, putting together the report. Uh, so we need to pause and think about that and um, and reflect on how we, if, if necessary, backtrack and, and, and provide more support for those folks because a lot of people as a result um, spent much of the last year feeling unheard and indeed were not heard from because they had not yet become comfortable asserting themselves in this forum. And then um, I guess the third point escapes me now, that is a, a function of middle age, but I, I just want to say this. Um, I, I think just about every group probably hit on the topic of trust. And I want to offer to the group as the group contrarian, I think, uh, we have so much to be proud of. <laughs> I mean, last year was a um, shaving cream show for sure, but uh, good God, I, the fact that we came together as we did and that the quality of product was uh, um, produced and the back and forth was genuine. That is what conflict and uh, occasional irritation reflects to you, that people are invested in this and they are participating in full when they feel they can. Th those are, I, I think we're being very, very hard on ourselves and each other in uh, talking about lack of trust. Uh, you just try to do this in another state. Just, just imagine that for a moment. And in, what we did here in Vermont is, um, I, I think we we showed the very best of what it means to be uh, somebody in this state invested in the public life and the values uh, of our uh, community, uh, writ large as a state. 
including the enormous amount of time we spend uh, earnestly and deeply reflecting on our shortcomings. Um, I, I have my issues about this um, statutory construct, but I've never once doubted the good faith and the goodwill of any person on this council. And I, I'm sure you have um, shown me the same courtesy. That's all. Thanks, Jim. Thanks so much. OK, um, Abby, go ahead. This is formulating in my head at the moment, so bear with me. Nothing that I haven't said before, but wanting to try to approach it in a little bit of a different way. I found myself in a, um, I was saying in our group that I've been out in a number of different places speaking about the work and um, was, in a, was in a group the other day where somebody that is involved in a position where their organization has impacts on people because of the policy decisions, the policy platforms that they wish to perpetuate or for which they're advocating. And it was put together in that room that when we're advocating for policies, those policies have repercussions to people. And the reality is those people aren't here for the most part. And I have heard feedback throughout the year. I think some people have been frustrated with me setting some of us aside here or those of us aside here who, um, as a way that those of us here are not real Vermonters. Of course, we're all real Vermonters. Of course, we're all um, invested in this work on a very deep level. But the reality is, is that most of us are not the people that are going to be either implementing the policy or the people who will be most impacted by it. And I just think that that differential in power and privilege that exists both within the council and within the subcommittees is something that needs to be really thoroughly grappled with as we move forward. And that even when it can feel really frustrating to hear somebody say, you don't understand, you have to be able to listen and hear that maybe you don't understand from their perspective and that that is valid, whether or not, you know, that, that yes, of course, we have to take action. Yes, of course, we have to move forward and we have to put these policies in place, but it is also our responsibility as indicated by the presentation this morning to communicate to people based on where they are and where they're coming from and what the impacts to them will be based on the decisions that we're trying to make. And so I just hope moving forward through the next year, we can really keep that close in our hearts that people are nervous and scared and living in really different circumstances from a lot of us. And that that needs to be kept at the forefront of how we're engaging and thinking and approaching the way that we do this work. Thanks. Thanks, Abby. Yeah. So with those reflections, I wonder, you know, after a break, we're going to come back. We're going to do um, just a look at the land acknowledgement, the, the follow up from what we did in December. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, updates from the subcommittees. And that feeds us into our work plan conversation. And so I want to carry forward what Abby just said, what everyone just said into that set of conversations, because I think it's so important um, when we're thinking about our work planning and what the subcommittees are doing, what they plan to do and what we plan to do as a council. Let's take a break now um, and let's make it uh, uh, a 10 minute break. 10 minutes breaks aren't very fun. Why don't we just come back at um, 10 to the hour um, make it like a 14 minute break um, and we'll ba be back at 1250.
um, and we'll dive into the remaining pieces of our meeting. Um, and I really want to thank everybody for, to, for doing this reflection. We'll see you back here at 10, 10 before the hour at, at, at 12.50, um, and we'll pick up on the pieces that we haven't done yet in our agenda. All right, folks, I'm going to turn my camera off. We'll see you in, in just under 15 minutes. <laughs> let, let folks get signed back on. Get your cameras back on if you might be able to. All right. Welcome back, folks. I'll give folks a second. <clears throat> All right. So if you're able to get your camera back on, this would be great. I see in the chat some folks are off camera for the this section. And Bram and Jane, I, I knew that Judy Dow was going to try to join us. She's not able to or is able to. Yeah, she, she was unable to join today, unfortunately. Um, there was a miscommunication where I said the right date, but wrong day. So um, um, yeah, I said <laughs> the 24th, but I said Tuesday, thinking the council still meets on Tuesday. So right. Judy was okay with Bram and I moving forward and Bram speaking to the process. So. Great. Okay. Yeah. I, she teaches on Mondays, I think. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Great. So welcome back, folks. Um, the first thing we wanted to do here was um, share the continuation of, of the work you all started in December on the land acknowledgement. And so Bram and Jane, if you want to walk us through just quickly what's happened, you, everybody has in the agenda, linked in the agenda is that um, one page land acknowledgement. Um, and, but Bram and Jane, do you wanna walk us through sort of how folks got there? Yeah, I'm happy to, and really um, appreciate Bram leaning into this since it's really been a collaborative process from with Judy and Bram um, since the meeting on the 24th. and. What you see, I just dropped in the chat a direct link to the land acknowledgement is really a reflection of the words that Judy helped um, you all put out there when we last met um, and then Bram and her taking the lead on pulling it together. So really appreciate that collaborative effort and the work that um, the council did at the meeting um, when we last met in December. So Bram, please, if you're willing to speak to um, how we got to this final document that we put forward, I'd appreciate that. Sure. I'd, I'd... Be, uh, be, be happy to. You know, my observation is that in our meetings, we all tend to be sort of appropriately professional. And, um, you know, I do want to acknowledge uh, June's observation that given the fact that a lot of sort of strangers and semi-strangers were thrown together from all different walks, the council worked together really well and produced a lot. But I think it is also true, June's other observation, the issue of trust probably came up in each uh, breakout group um, is, is also true. You know, to greater or lesser extents, we don't all know each other that well, and we don't know how much we can trust each other in particular areas. But, you know, the process that Judy guided us through in forming a land acknowledgement got us to a place where kind of everyone just opened their hearts. And, you know, the, the, the work we did there and what people put in the chat, I mean, everyone just shared very openly, shared their love, how much they love Vermont, how much they love the trees and the animals and the mountains and the birds and the rivers, and the snow and, and, and the whole thing. Um, and it was really lovely uh, to just have that, that outpouring and, and people coming together, not as policy experts or advocates, but as humans and as, and as artists and as poets. Um, so it was a really fun part of the process. Uh, you know, Judy had took us, had, uh, Judy took us through, uh, guided us through that process and created the framework for um, a land acknowledgement. And, uh, you know, we gathered everything that people had put in the chat and all the notes from the session we did 
and organize them in uh, sort of that framework along with what the other things that uh, uh, you know Judy had shared with us um, were important components of a meaningful land acknowledgement. And you know we sent it back and forth a few times and um, did did some wordsmithing and um, ended up with something that uh, I think um, Jane and I were, were, were probably both uh, delighted and relieved when Judy gave us a good grade on the work that we handed to her um, and said, this is a, this is a, a meaningful and, and, and good land acknowledgement. So that's, that's how we got to where we are. Thanks, Bram. And thanks, Jane. Yeah. And um, so you as a council, um, you know, this, the step you have right now is to say, yes, let's take this land acknowledgement. Let's put it into our climate action plan um, as, a, as an expression in this moment of time of an acknowledgement we want to make. Um, Jane, is there something, can you say anything more about how this will show up in the climate action plan or in, in somewhere else? Yeah, so there is a placeholder um, in the climate hack section plan right now to insert this document. And our expectation and understanding is that um, upon the council's approval today, we would make this insertion in the document as it was on the website. And likely appropriately, since it is a standalone piece, we could consider listing it also down below um, if the council would move to do so where we have the appendices just because they're separate links. If there's something um, relative, re um, if we would like to do that with the land acknowledgement, we could too. But for now, it's just simply um, removing the placeholder in the cap and inserting this document. So, Got it. Got it. Okay. That's helpful. Okay. I guess I would uh, also add that all of the words in the land acknowledgement that are not English were written by Judy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, any reflections or comments folks want to make before we take the step to say, yes, please, let's include this acknowledgement? Anything folks want to say before we do that? Oh, and Leslie Ann, I'm just seeing your text. Does someone want to read it? It's a nice idea. Uh, volunteers? I, David, I will be happy to if everyone feels that is uh, appropriate. Um, Let's do it. This uh, is titled Land Acknowledgement, subtitled An Expression of Gratitude to the Land and Her First People, dated December 21st, 2021. Hello, Alnabak which is translated as humans. We have gathered close to the geographic center of what is now called Vermont, the very Western side of Ndakina. We gather at Montpelier, the place that was once the bottom of Lake Winooski. We acknowledge the traditional homelands of the Winooski people on the day of the winter solstice. The sun is at its lowest point. For many cultures, this is a day of celebration, a day that marks the death and rebirth of the sun. We thank the sun, the soil, the water, the air, the plants, and the animals for our food and water, for our clothing and shelter, for the air we breathe, for life. We acknowledge the beautiful snow that shines brightly in the sunshine and shows us a hundred shades of white, blue, and gray, and the rabbit, turkey, deer, raccoon, and squirrel prints on her blanket. We hear the gentle wind rustling the maple leaves on the ground and the rust brown beech leaves in the trees. There are evergreen trees and trees who have lost their leaves and trees whose leaves are brown and still on the branch. We hear the wind whispering in the white pines boughs weighted with snow. We hear the songs of the chickadees, juncos and crows and see the blue jays and squirrels foraging. The land has had a thousand ages and will have a thousand more. It has lain at the bottom of the sea and been pushed up into towering peaks, has borne flood and fire and glacier. 
We honor the Winooski people that have cared for this land since the last glacier receded and long before. We recognize the community they created across untold generations and the physical and cultural genocide they have endured for 400 years. We acknowledge with humility and gratitude how they have endured with one heart and one mind and the protection they have provided to this land in spite of the atrocities from which they themselves were not protected. The waterways and watersheds are essential to understanding the land. Caring for the watershed is caring for the people. Today, December 21st, 2021, the snow melts into rivulets flowing into the north branch of the Winooski, home to crayfish and mussels and a thousand other creatures. The surface ripples of the Winooski River shine like glass as the wind blows it along. This special place is the meeting place of many confluences. The Winooski's seven large tributaries, the Little River, the North Branch, the Kingsbury River, the Huntington River, the Dog River, the Mad River, and the Stevens Branch, all join the Winooski near here. In the past, ancient ones would gather at this confluence for meetings and treaties and weddings, for planning and celebrating. It is here that many still meet to plan and celebrate this land. It is here that we meet to make our commitments to the land and to the future. We know our work will affect every living thing in this land, and we acknowledge our debt and our responsibility to all of them. Abraham. That's wonderful. Okay. Wow. All right, we can just sit with that for a second. Um, any comments before we move to adopt this into our, into your cap? Okay. Great, I see a lot of um, appreciation out there. Okay, any concerns before we, um, any concerns about pulling this into your climate action plan? Okay, great. Well, let's pull it in. Um, thanks everybody who worked on this. All of you contributed words and thoughts to this, who participated in that meeting in December. Bram, you did a wonderful, clearly wonderful lift um, with Judy and with others and Jane. So thank you for taking leadership on that. Okay, great, um, wonderful. The final thing we wanted to do is a two-step piece. Again, these are all really good things to pull into these conversations, whether it's land acknowledgement, whether it's the reflections on how 2021 went. The final two things we need to do, which are related is, we've asked subcommittee co-chairs to just give us a few words about what they've been doing this month so far, or if it's been nothing yet, what they're planning on doing um, into this year. And then we've got a short presentation that we showed to the steering committee about a work plan for 2022. And we wanna show that to you and get some reactions and really start to settle in on the outlines of your work plan this year. Let's start by working our way through sort of quickly having the subcommittee co-chairs giving us just verbal two to three minute um, uh, updates on what's going on on your end. And there's no particular order on this. Maybe Jane, you had an idea of order, but I think um, let's just work our way through. Um, I'm happy to start with cross-sector mitigation. Um, and then why don't we do cross-sector and science and data? We'll do those two together because I know there's been some work going on. And then we'll go over to rural resilience, to ag and ecosystem, and we'll do just transitions. So let's start with cross-sector and then science and data. So I'm not sure who, if Rich, you're going to be the one to give us a little update on that. I think I am. <clears throat> I think Peter had to leave. Uh, quick report from, from cross-sector. Uh, begins with our work in the legislature. The committee members have been pretty active in legislature already on uh, the mitigation recommendations of the CAP, particularly weatherization at scale, 
uh, and the clean heat standard. And, um, you know, thanks to David Farnsworth and Christine Donovan. Um, and I also testified in, in both the House and the Senate. And I guess I'd like to just report back to the council that the two legislative committees uh, responsible for this area uh, seem really serious about listening to the recommendations of the council. And I, I, it's important for the council, you know, to understand how seriously the legislature is uh, attending to our recommendations. It's unclear, you know, of course, always unclear whether um, and to what degree legislation will be enacted this session, but they are paying attention to the fact that we recommended action to, be, to happen this year. Um, in other work of the committee, uh, let me say that across the board, the committee is looking forward to opportunities to engage with uh, more and different Vermonters as the year goes by. Um, we're, so we're really looking forward to uh, the evolution of a public listening and engagement strategy. On substance, we formed a small working group to address transportation. Um, everybody knows that because of the situation with TCI, the regional initiative, um, we promised in the CAP that we would examine this question and come up with recommendations for uh, Vermont action. And we would do so in the first half of this year. So there's a transportation working group now underway. Joey Miller is leading that up and may want to say something uh, in a minute about that. Um, Gina is here with us today as well. She's will be working on that as well. We're also going to follow up with a, a small working group to discuss biomass questions that were tabled uh, at the time of the adoption of, of the CAP. So we have those two working groups um, going on. And then uh, finally, the committee is looking forward to, to receiving the results of the modeling from uh, Cadmus and EFG assessing the expected results of the actions that we've recommended in the CAP. And um, we're going to be meeting to hear the results of that modeling soon. Jane, you might you know, state the date on that. Great. Thanks, Rich. I see a question in, in the chat. This is the uh, asking what committee are we talking about? It's mm -hmm. a cross-sector mitigation subcommittee. Right, which dealt with transportation, you know, buildings, uh, energy, and non-energy uh, emissions mm -hmm. reductions. Correct. Yeah. Thanks, Rich. Um, okay. Uh, let's go to science and data because there's some overlap there. Um, I don't know if Jared or somebody else or who wants to say a word from science and data. Thank, thanks, David. Um, yeah, I checked in with, with TJ and I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. I don't actually think he's able to be on right now. Um, first, just following up on Rich's report out from Cross Sector, I'm going to put in the chat the link to the transportation policy options memo that the cross-sector mitigation subcommittee uh, discussed last week that was put together by that transportation task group. Um, the science and data subcommittee meet, met for the first time in 2022, last Wednesday. Um, a few key highlights, we um, received an, or we, we had an overview of a draft of a request for information to go out um, that was drafted by um, AN, Agency of Natural Resources staff um, focusing on how Vermont can uh, supplement our existing greenhouse gas inventory um, with analysis of life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, the deadline for kind of public comment on that is end of day tomorrow. And then the task group that's been focused on the inventory and that uh, life cycle accounting question 
uh, will meet on th this Thursday to finalize that um, with the goal to have that request for information um, going out by the end of this month um, so that we can uh, get those responses. It, it leads to a, a bigger question that was really front and center in my mind in our earlier conversation about kind of takeaways from our first year of work and what does that mean for our next year of work together, which is a question around resources, both in terms of funds uh, to provide consulting services or to be able to issue something like a request for a proposal um, and um, staff support to do a lot of the analysis that is kind of pointed to or is necessary over the next year, but was not part of the initial kind of work plan. And I, I just think that um, that's something that we're going to need to to focus on and make some decisions about because I think there's a number of things that are being identified, whether it's a future desired uh, request for proposals on doing life cycle analysis, whether it's further uh, policy and economic analysis on some of the transportation policy that um, we'll, we'll need further support either in the form of resources and consulting or additional staff support to, to move forward. And I don't think we've fully answered those questions yet. Um, but to get back to the report out um, from Science and Data, there was also, also an update that Jane provided on the uh, measuring and assessing progress uh, tool. Um, that document is up um, you know, with, with the materials uh, on the calendar from our, our last meeting. Um, there is some, one of the things that we're going to be focusing on is um, subcommittee composition. So um, TJ Poor, our current co-chair, um, has a new position, as many folks may know, as planning director at the um, Public Service Department. And so he, um, I think I'm going to share this news on his behalf because I don't think he is on, will be switching over to the cross-sector mitigation subcommittee, if that's okay, Commissioner Tierney. <laughs> yeah, share it if you hadn't, so go for it, Jared. And forgive me, this is my idea of bifocals. I don't I think it's breaking news because he provided it in the subcommittee, but yeah, Excellent. He, okay. he is planning to... <laughs> to move over to the cross-sector mitigation subcommittee. And so we'll be stepping down as, as co-chair. Um, similarly, um, the, uh, or on a related note, the Public Service Department is, is very lucky to have uh, one of our subcommittee members, who, Lou Ciceri, who had been uh, at Velco uh, most of last year and, and when he was selected for the subcommittee, um, he is now employed at the Public Service Department. And so there was a, um, TJ and, and, and Lou had proposed that um, Lou step off of that subcommittee and the recommendation that will go to the steering committee is that Claire McElvenny will be the new um, public service department um, kind of representative or designee on that subcommittee, which is great because Claire has been so involved in, in so many of the, so much of the work of the science data subcommittee and, and as uh, and providing staff support over the last year. Um, so we will be um, identifying a new co-chair for the subcommittee from among the um, administration um, counselors or designees. Um, we are also taking this moment to try to expand our, our subcommittee in terms of the breadth of experience and expertise. Um, we have noted that um, we certainly we would love to add um, an economist um, and we also want to make sure that a number of the other criteria in terms of geographic uh, diversity in terms of, uh, you know, different lived experiences are, are also considered. Um, and so we will be sending out an email to the council welcoming nominations um, based on some of those criteria. Um, if folks have individuals they'd like to suggest to us in the next um, couple of weeks, um, Jane or I will, will follow up on that. Um, in terms of our work plan as a subcommittee going forward, there's a number of things that we're either going to be directly or indirectly um, involved with. One is the review of the responses to the request for information on life cycle and or upstream emissions accounting, and hopefully involved in the development of an RFP if um, the resources to move that work forward can be identified. Um, continuing work on the uh, measuring and assessing progress, which was required by the Global Warming Solutions Act um, and um, CADMUS and EFG, our, our consultants have put forward the initial kind of phased plan for that, that it was presented. Um, additional analysis on the, the LEAP modeling of our emissions reduction pathways and some of the economic analysis that goes beyond that. Um, 
a, there is there is further work related to the carbon budget that we want to work with the Ag and Ecosystem Subcommittee um, on. Um, I there are people on the Science and Data Subcommittee who will want to be part of the um, next steps on the biomass recommendations, which I think is probably a working group that will span uh, almost all, if not all, of the subcommittees. Um, and then there are subcommittee members who um, are uh, will be involved in um, the municipal vulnerability index uh, work. Um, I may have missed something, but I feel like I've gone on for a, a while. So I'm going to just stop there. And if uh, Jane or other subcommittee members think that there is something important that I missed, please do um, speak up. Thanks, Jared. Super helpful. Abby, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question regarding the plans for the, the future of the um, AFOLU emission inventory RFP and where that lies. Jane, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, I think that that we that had started in Ag and Eco, and I know that at Science and Data, there's been an understanding and expectation that if the RFP moves forward, that um, science and data would surely want to help support that and manage that across, across both science and data and ag and eco to ensure coordination more closely this time so it's not siloed. Um, but we have not made the decision to move forward with any RFPs yet because of our limited technical analysis budget. And that's gonna be set into based on our work planning conversation about how we prioritize um, what RFPs and actual like resources that we have. The advancement of the RFI for the life cycle analysis is just that learning more. Um, and we'll have to have that same conversation when and if we want to move forward with an RFP for that work. Great. Thank you. That's helpful. Great. Okay. Um, so maybe Abby, I'll take advantage of this, <laughs> excuse me, your comment to say. What would you like to update folks on in terms of the thinking that's been going on in ag, ag and ecosystems, um, or if you want to defer to a co-chair, um, but uh, any update you'd like to share with the council on this? I have, I have very few updates on our subcommittee. Um, there was a, a significant burnout factor experienced, I think, by all those involved. And so there has been quite a uh, uh, conscious pause. Um, additionally, there are some factors, you know, one of our subcommittee members was just recently appointed as the Farm Service Agency Director by President Biden. And so, you know, unclear as to exactly what the makeup of our subcommittee can be moving forward. Um, but we do have a meeting on the books for, I believe it's February 4th, um, and hoping to sort of determine it that what the makeup of the subcommittee looks like currently, who is, you know, able to continue or wishes to continue and who needs to step away, and then what the process would be to refill those spots. And then also um, to set up, you know, the smaller groups of who's going to be uh, involved in the, the cross-sector um, talks about biomass emissions, inventories, et cetera, moving forward. So that's, that's the plan. We're just a little bit behind. That's great. That's great. A purposeful pause sounds just what the doctor ordered. <laughs> so, all right. Um, Erica or somebody else from uh, Rural Resilience um, or Catherine, uh, uh, what would you like to update folks on? So uh, Rural Resilience has not met yet this year. We will be meeting for the first time um, this year tomorrow. Um, so on the agenda is to discuss uh, some work planning for the year. Um, at a minimum, there's some statutory requirements that we need to ensure that we are um, meeting, uh, including the um, development of the Municipal Vulnerability Index, which I understand that there's some um, resource support underway for. Um, for, for at least being pursued, <laughs> um, and uh, as well as uh, developing um, tools uh, or at least referencing tools uh, for municipalities to build climate resilience um, locally. Um, we're working with Marianne on that. Um, Catherine, did I miss anything? 
I'll add that for both of those, the vulnerability index and the municipal toolkit, we hope to build substantially on work that's already been done and also seek input from counselors as well as our subcommittee members to serve on a smaller working group to help advance both of those. We're also going to be looking at our subcommittee membership and, and inviting those who need to step off the opportunity to do so with grace and appreciation, and then incur but encouraging everyone to stay on and looking at the voices that we're missing and ensuring that we have a, a, a real robust subcommittee membership. And then um, two more quick things. One is that I think we need to have a conversation at some point and a better understanding about how science and data related to resiliency and adaptation is going to be considered and whether um, that is supposed to be within our bailiwick or science and data is taking that on in conjunction with us and just moving forward and thinking about that. And then I, I don't know if we if there's any sort of gold star process where our committee gets the gold star for the first action being implemented. Um, it was temporary, but the governor did sign into law the changes to the open meeting law that were one of our priority actions. Fantastic. We'll, we'll wait our gold stars, however, yeah. <laughs> planning to get to us. <laughs> well We've already done. them internally. We're just, you know, floating it for the council. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, fantastic. Um, thanks both for that. Um, Sue Minter, did you want to update folks on what's going on in, in Just Transitions? Sure, hi everybody. Um, our group also has not met, um, but does plan to meet. And I would say <clears throat> that we, and I also wanna recognize, I think Sarah Phillips might be on the call. Yep. Yep. And I want to A, thank her for her amazing co chairmanship with me and others, um, but that she needs to sort of go back to her life. <laughs> and um, while she says she can remain a member of our committee, she can't really take on the time and responsibility of being a co chair. So we are in search of another co chair and would love suggestions. And I think I understand that. And certainly it would be helpful to have that person be maybe a state staff employee. Um, so we're recruiting. Um, I hope we have lots of people interested. I think uh, really looking forward, um, we've talked anyway as a subcommittee about our role helping to try to guide the public engagement process. We have established a small subcommittee that's trying to think about that. And um, working with Jane and David and others, um, I guess there is an idea of actually trying to make a public engagement process with the legislature. And I don't know what that looks like because there's so many committees of jurisdiction. There's also a climate caucus, but there is an interest in having an event or maybe a series of events that are closer to the uh, folks uh, on the ground who um, want to be involved or are most impacted by our ideas. So that's an idea. Um, and we also want to be very um, proactive uh, quickly around uh, translation services, that this is a real area of, um, that we really are, are not even in compliance with the law <laughs> on our climate action plan right now um, without um, robust translation. So we want to work uh, expeditiously on that, and I believe the agency does too. Um, I will say that, you know, there is an environmental justice bill um, and some parts of that include uh, uh, constituting an advisory committee on environmental justice, which from where I sit um, would be so beneficial in terms of keeping in some way the work of the Just Transition Subcommittee to this council kind of ongoing. Uh, it's not exactly the same, obviously, but there are some important linkages, which gives me a lot of hope. I, I can't help but emphasize, want to emphasize the need to address the compensation issue. I'm sure our subcommittee will, um, similar to what Catherine was saying, you know, see who really is gracefully ready to step down and who still has the courage to continue on. But there is a tremendous frustration around compensation. Uh, and unless we can do more uh, on that front, I very much worry about uh, any sustainability of our efforts. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say, Sarah, unless you wanted to say something else. 
Thanks. No, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. That's great. And Sue, I might just add as well to your comment around the potentially doing something with the legislature. The other big piece that that small group's looking at is how do we do the partner-based engagement that you've been an advocate for as well and others and the council has sought. Um, and, right. and that's a big piece of that. Yeah, that's I would say that's the, the fundamental piece is sort of how do we actually build sort of the framework almost for what we think moving forward beyond uh, this council's uh, coming together. I don't know how what our future looks like, but at a minimum, we want to think strategically about partnering with lots of different organizations about doing much more foundational, the kind of work we wish we could have done over the last year, um, but feel like it's it's almost the beginning of actually setting that foundation. And so CBI, David, and others are going to work with us on setting that into play, into motion, I guess. Thanks, so. Okay, great. All right, so that's the work, what's going on with subcommittees. Um, anything else before we take a peek at this, what might be a work plan for you all? Anything around subcommittee work? Chris, Campany? I guess just briefly, under the Global Warming Solutions Act, it charges the, the Just Transition Subcommittee with um, basically ensuring we achieve a just transition in Vermont. Um, it doesn't, doesn't charge the council with that, it charges the subcommittee. So at some point, um, and the subcommittee needs to discuss this first, but at some point we need to come back and probably have an intentional conversation about how, how do we make sure that the cap, you know, includes the just transitions solutions? What does, how do we ensure the council does that? How do we uh, police ourselves? That kind of thing. Um, Cause it's just not realistic to, to uh, the subcommittee can certainly provide guidance <laughs> and, and offer opinions and that kind of thing. But I think it's a lot to put on one committee. Ideally, the, uh, ideally the act would have charged the council with that, but not, but it didn't, so. Thanks, Chris, for bringing that up. Let's keep that front and center as we're thinking about the work plan as well. Okay, um, let's look at this, um, a couple slides, and Jane's gonna share a screen right now. I can see her doing it. Um, and Jane and I will tag team this a little bit because we've been talking about this and with. Uh, and with this is a presentation that we also talked with the uh, uh, steering committee about. So those of you in the steering committee will recognize this as the same set of slides um, that we looked at and discussed. So if we roll forward, what we want to talk about are these areas of work, right? The VCC is you, the Vermont Climate Council. What are the areas that you need to be leaning into in 2022? What does ANR need to prioritize uh, and feel statutory obligated, uh, statutorily obligated to prioritize in 2022? And how are we going to coordinate all together, whether it's council, subcommittees, ANR, and others, right? And all this while the legislature is kind of the center of uh, the action, at least in this first part of 2022. So that's what we want to talk about in this presentation of these buckets. And the first bucket is your focus areas. Um, and here we divide it up between substantive issues. And you've heard them mentioned already today. The two big ones that were left over from uh, December were transportation, you've heard about, and then the biomass pieces that were tabled um, and need addressing. So there's two really, two substantive issues that are on your plate um, this year, uh, and particularly in the first half of this year. Then there's technical work, and we've heard a little bit of some questions about this, um, some of which has already been budgeted, um, and some of which are uh, statutory obligations on ANR and others. Um, and so there's a need to oversee and complete what was already begun, and then some prioritization of what to do 
uh, beyond that work and also probably some advocacy to the legislature to, uh, to get the funds that you think are needed to do this work in the next fiscal year. And then the third area is around engagement, right? And the engagement is what we've been talking about on several occasions today and previously. Sorry, someone needs to mute, I think. And, um, and on that, um, this is where what we were just talking about with Sue and others uh, is you know, where you have an important role as a council to oversee the kind of engagement that you really wanna have. Um, okay, so those are three areas of work for you. Um, and then if we go forward, these are areas of work for ANR, and I think Jane's in the best position to talk about um, ANR's priorities. Yeah, so briefly, just building upon what David said and some other components, um, we have um, some remaining technical analysis funds that are in our current fiscal year, and then we expect to receive some component of them for um, fiscal year 23, which starts July 1st. Currently, um, we're still working with Cadmus and EFG to complete the Vermont Pathways Analysis Report. So that's the report that really speaks to how we're gonna meet our emissions reductions. Um, there's been a lot of back and forth around that. And our expectation at this point is to have it wrapped up neatly um, by mid-February. Um, the analysis um, it for, around the emissions reductions is currently done and the um, redo, rerun, I should say, of the economic modeling is currently happening. And then the final report will be presented to cross-sector um, when they meet again in February. In addition, ANR, um, there were two rules um, put forward in the Climate Action Plan for ANR to implement. Um, there is an explicit timeline um, for the agency to move forward with those rules this year. Um, they are supposed to be presented to LCAR by July 1st and presented to you all 45 days before that. Um, so we have a group of us within ANR, um, Megan O'Toole, myself, um, Legislative Council, and others, uh, Deirdre Ritzler, working specifically to advance um, advanced clean cars too and advanced clean trucks. Um, so those will come back to the council this spring. Um, there are two components that ANR uh, sees as statutory requirements explicitly that we plan to prioritize our remaining GWSA budget funds for, um, which speaks to the tool that um, we have to have up and running by 2024 that tracks the progress of how we're meeting the objectives of the GWSA. This is somewhat in um, partnership parallel to the greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, uh, inventory, but also speaks to resilience um, and adaptation, as well as um, specific um, objectives for wildlife and biodiversity in the act. Um, this is something that we were able to develop a framework for, for this initial climate action plan, but have been working with um, Cadmus to think about a scope and budget for that. And ANR is in a position as we receive that to make a decision whether or not we will move forward with um, Cadmus and ESG or pause and do a whole new RFP for the measuring and progress tool. We expect to make that decision in the next few weeks, um, which will take a significant component of our remaining budget for this year to do so. The other component that we um, plan to use at the remaining funds are, are is on what Catherine and Erica were speaking to, which is the Municipal Vulnerability Index tool, which is also spoken to clearly in um, statute and we'll work um, to put together a task group that will be comprised of folks from rural resilience, but also I imagine um, have folks from just transition, science and data, um, and we'll be thinking about how we advance that in the coming weeks to plan for um, an RFP this spring to build that out. And as Catherine noted, build upon existing tools that we learned about over the course of the last year as well. And then as specifically around public engagement and outreach, ANR has a limited um, component and capacity here to support this. Um, for folks who don't know, um, we have terminated our contract with Climate Access and RISE. Um, a lot, we could have a lot of conversation around that, um, but there are components of that contract that we are now pivoting to think about how we meet the objectives of that going forward, understanding that the focus of this next phase of climate access and RISE work was really around um, online engagement meetings, 
as well as putting forward a deliberative polling or engagement platform, which didn't feel relative to your interests and concerns that we heard about for public engagement. And so we've been thinking about how we continue to think about online engagement meetings in general and educate Vermonters about what's in the Climate Action Plan and make it more accessible um, through translation, through um, um, bringing in stories, which we um, solicited you all to help um, think about how we do so, and then how we think about partner engagement and support that. Um, and so those, these are, there are limited components that ANR can support that I expect the, the council will want to think about broader um, engagement and the resources needed to do that. So we've been convening a small group of Just Transitions to really understand what ANR's contribution will be and how that meets the goals for Just Transitions and the council and where you'll want to go above and beyond in advocating for additional resources. And then finally, I just want to say that we've been working really closely with JFO to provide them um, the materials they need to complete their economic um, analysis of the Climate Action Plan. And there's no explicit date for that, the release of that plan, um, but we understand and expect that that report will be um, forthcoming during the legislative session and have been working closely with Joyce Manchester to support her the development of that. Thanks, Jane. For those who aren't so great on acronyms, JFO stands for? Thank you. Well, could you just... Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, um, given that the council, you all have some uh, likely have priorities this year, ANR has priorities that are related to that, and there needs to be some coordination of the work. And what has emerged in this year so far? particularly around the way the transportation work has happened, um, is a, a process of having ad hoc small groups come up that typically pull across the subcommittees uh, and includes counselors and key state staff um, to work on these issues that are kind of tricky issues that require the different subcommittees to weigh in or different areas to weigh in. And so this seems to be emerging as a process where ad hoc groups develop initial sets of recommendations, they get lifted up to subcommittees, subcommittees chew on them, approve them, and then the council serves as a body to do a final um, overview check and approval. Uh, to make this work, there has to be a lot of transparency about what's going on. And so there's a bullet in there about ensuring transparency um, so that folks know what's going on, who's on these small groups, how do you get involved? It also means less frequent meetings of the subcommittees in the council, which is a request that we've heard loud and clear from you all and from subcommittee members. We're expecting a rhythm of work of subcommittees, therefore, of being perhaps once a month, and then the council, you all, meeting less than that. Um, perhaps quarterly, uh, and that's something to talk about. Um, and in just the next slide, we'll say a few things about timing and, and when you all have certain things you need to work on. Um, but part of this in that final bullet there came out of the steering committee conversation, which is if the council, you all are gonna meet less frequently, that we need to do a better job, all of us, of getting materials with significant advance warning if you're going to be asked to sign off on things, and that's the rhythm of these meetings. So that's a way of coordination that'll feel a little different than 2021, uh, where we're creating these sort of working groups or ad hoc groups, and that they bring up things to the subcommittees, which then bring it up to the council. Um, Jane, if you want to go forward and talk a little bit about the sort of uh, timing of things, for the council. Yeah, so, thank you, David. So the um, I just wanted to suggest there, as you start to think about work planning and scheduling council meetings, because you'll notice uh, or note that there are no council meetings scheduled after today. And so we'll be looking to you for guidance on when you'd like to meet again and how often. I thought it would contextually be important to understand sort of the timing and expectations of um, the work that's being done um, by both ANR um, and the legislature and then by subcommittees to understand where and when touch points with the council will be um, especially critical. 
So in the short term, um, it is not, it is somewhat a usual process for um, staff to report out to councils and committees on um, what the budget is looking like towards this work about halfway through the legislative session. So obviously the governor put forward his budget and the big bill last week I shared with you on Friday um, some of the highlights from that as it relates to climate work, um, both specific to ANR's budget and then specific to ARPA dollars um, and elsewhere. Um, and so we, we would be prepared to um, articulate to all of you what it is looking like we will have for fiscal year 23 funds um, at somewhere through halfway through that legislative mark, typically around town meeting day. And we would be prepared um, to speak to you on that so that the council could be considering what other resources that you would want to be advocating for um, in order to see through work priorities for the coming year. I think in the short term, um, it will, in order to be prepared to articulate budget needs, um, and I, there was some um, already noise in the chat about this, there were a lot of technical analyses put forward as next steps in the climate action plan. Um, Abby asked about um, ag emissions RFP. There is an RFI going out on life cycle analysis that will lead to it likely an RFP. Um, there were numerous other components, and right now we don't have a clear path for funding those. Um, and so based on what we have for a budget, that would lead to more conversation about um, what the immediate priorities are and then where we would need and advocate for resources. As well, the public engagement strategy, that small group will, is continuing to meet weekly around formulating a proposal for a public engagement strategy for this, um, for the CAP, and then hopefully to be setting up systems for long-term engagement. Um, as we understand and expect that that's the commitment we all want to make. So we're really thinking about how to put forward ideas and touch points now that set up the system and structure for long-term engagement. And I think um, presenting that to the council after just transitions um, has met and discussed it will be really important um, in the short term uh, rather than waiting till um, months out from now. And then finally, just a reminder that the biomass recommendations and the transportation recommendations were spoken to in the CAP as coming back to the council for consensus recommendations um, in the spring of this year. So um, I know the timeline for the transportation um, process that has been approved by the um, cross-sector subcommittee speaks to June as the time for uh, new recommendations coming up to the council. And I understand and expect that biomass um, will take at least that long, if not longer, but we did spell out spring in the climate action plan. And then again, rulemaking articulates a need for the council to meet mid-May, which is 45 days before it would go to LCAR. Okay. Okay. So those are components. We don't have anything else to show you. Those are components of a work plan where we're talking about the issues that need to be addressed. We're talking about how the work gets done. And we're talking about some practical implications about how frequently you as a council meet, how frequently the subcommittees meet. Um, let's just have a quick conversation about this. When you see this, what about this is resonating? What about this is confusing? How can we have some greater clarity here? And then we can make some real decisions about how frequently the council needs to meet and when. But how is this landing? What's confusing? What's working well here? Catherine? I think given everything that's on our plate, it doesn't seem like we're quite ready to move to quarterly meetings. <laughs> I'll just throw that out there as a thought, at least um, initially. And I, although I support the idea of these smaller working groups, because I think it's gonna be the most effective way to get some of the detailed work done, I think there's two issues we need to pay attention to there. One is um, that it doesn't have the same transparency as a formal subcommittee where the requirements of the agenda to be posted. and so having some clear expectation of how people are kept informed about that work will be really important. And then the second issue, um, wanting to put an exclamation point on Sue reminding us about compensation, is I don't know that the statute and the compensation is set up so that people are compensated for their participation in task groups like they are 
informal subcommittees. And so I don't want that to be a barrier for participation for those on the council or subcommittee or otherwise involved for whom compensation is important for their participation. Can I just respond to that real quick? I, I just so folks have clarity that that's a great point, Catherine. And um, you can get an hourly rate, but it is 650. You cannot get the $50 per diem for a meeting when you work in an official capacity outside of a subcommittee meeting or a council meeting. Sorry, I'm on mute. My bad. I was saying, Jared, go ahead, please. I'm happy to defer to, to Joey. I think I've yeah. speaking more, spoken more recently than she has, but. Joey, maybe. go ahead. Yeah. Um, I guess I have several thoughts, but one of them goes back to, um, and I don't mean to like take the conversation in a different direction, but the technical analyses um, that you would outline, Jane, that are in the hopper and then others that we might want to put in the hopper you know, I guess two of them. So I don't want to derail the conversation, but we went very quickly through that. And David, I guess I just don't know the process for a conversation about if we think that there are other needs and this is a mo you know moment to put those needs into the legislative arena, like funding, you know, you know and there's an RFI for life cycle greenhouse gas emission and assessment. I think we fundamentally need that. That's the foundation about upon which a lot of our recommendations are premised. So, and I'm just trying to understand, I didn't wanna like insert it into the conversation, but we went fast through it, but I think it's really important to get a list of all the different things that people think that we need. And I would put on the radar, that one is a priority that I would offer. And then Gina noted, I think the, the sort of BMT reduction analysis, the land use analysis, I think is also really important, but I'm sure there are many other things and there's a limited budget so it's really a process question, but I want to make sure that it is on the table, especially the greenhouse gas emission accounting. Well, I, I think it's an entirely appropriate question right now, Joey. And I think from my standpoint, it comes down to when do you as a council need to be sending signals to the legislature about priorities and about budgeting? And how do you also couple that with what Jane says, which is when is when are is everybody going to have a better idea about how the budget is shaping up? So it feels like there's a conversation that needs to happen in the coming weeks slash months where you got to get the timing right on that. Um, and I, I'm not the expert there, but I, I hope somebody else could say, yeah, the ideal timing for you all to have that conversation is X. And then let's schedule a council meeting and have it kind of thing. Just, just to add to that, David, I think that another part of that question is, is not just when, but but how. And at the risk of stating the obvious, I think we might be in a situation where, you know, like when we made as a council the um, recommendations on the ARPA funds, um, counselors who are cabinet members to refrain from voting on that because they needed and wanted to be aligned with with the governor's um, budget and and Jane or Julie please correct me if I'm wrong but my understanding is that even though there is a proposal that I personally think is 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 really important and I'm really supportive of in the governor's proposed budget to to expand or to create and then expand a, a climate office within the agency of natural resources including three new staff positions that could help with some of this work my understanding is that in the current budget proposal, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, that there is not much in the way of um, additional um, funds to support the type of technical analysis many of the subcommittees and the council itself as a whole in the cap pointed to as being necessary to advance our work. And so it, it, to me, that raises the question, are we going to be in a situation like we were when we made the ARPA recommendations where our the kind of administration members of the council are going to have to kind of recuse themselves, but the rest of the council has to come together to say, if this technical analysis is important as it was pointed to in the cap, there needs to be a way to identify that and advocate for that. Um, otherwise we could be in a situation where a lot of the things that we have identified as necessary to move forward in the next year, 
wouldn't have funding come July 1st and wouldn't be able to, to be acted on until, um, you know, 2023 at the earliest. And I, and I don't think that that is a um, kind of a tenable situation for us. So I think we need to have some kind of frank and direct conversations about the, the when and the how those, those recommendations get made because of that complicating dynamic. Sue, go ahead, please. Um, well, my point is not dissimilar from what Jared was raising, but it's just, um, you know, being asked to testify uh, on various things, some of which connect and intersect um, with this work, um, but where we may diverge um, to the point of the ARPA funding if they were, there's sort of potentially a trade off between establishing an office that we all or that some of us supported, uh, or continuing with these um, funds. So I, I'm, I just want us to be aware that we may have some difficulties staying cohesive uh, as a body in the legislature. Um, and so that's, it's just a difficult um, situation that I foresee. And I guess I would like to say that uh, we would all uh, recognize that we do work as a body uh, and we also have different roles that we may play in our respective lives, uh, running organizations or advocacy groups um, for which we might advocate something that is potentially divergent. It's an issue, that's all. Thanks, Sue. And does that issue you're bringing up advocate for us to meet on these issues sooner rather than later? If if folks are out there right now, like testifying in the legislature, et cetera? Well, I think uh, not necessarily. I think people should, I think there's the work of this council, uh, some of which is, you know, advancing the ball. And there's the work that we each uh, may play in our respective roles outside of this council. And, um, I'm not sure we can resolve all of that in this council. Maybe we should try to at least discuss the differences. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna say, I kind of like the idea of quarterly meetings. I'm really concerned about my ability to stay on this if it's a whole lot more than that. Um, and already I don't have a co-chair. And I think the work that our subcommittee is doing is very important and I don't wanna let that flounder. Uh, but I don't know that everything is resolvable, I guess, David, so I'm not sure how additional meetings help with some of this, but probably would be better than not. Thanks, Sue. Secretary Moore? Sure. I, I think there are a couple of issues at play here, and, and welcome uh, Secretary Klauser to, to weigh in and, and correct me as I go along. But I think there's... Um, some fairly clear statutory obligations. And I would offer that I think the governor's budget provides appropriate funding for addressing those two pieces, which are the municipal vulnerability index and the work needed to, to stand up or, or put in place a system for measuring and tracking progress. Uh, there is some money contained in the governor's budget, both ongoing and one-time money um, in service of, of those two objectives. And I think it's when we get beyond those pieces that it gets complicated. Um, in part, it's complicated because there is a, a long list, and some of this is being alluded to in the chat, of different activities, analyses, and efforts uh, that each of the individual subcommittees has identified. I don't know that we've yet brought those back together um, to make any sort of prioritized list or even an assessment of how much or what kinds of resources would be needed to, to implement them. Um, I think there is quite a bit of, of work to be done in that space. Um, and as, as Sue and Jared both acknowledged that, you know, the administration supports the, the governor's budget. And I feel very comfortable in that. I think we have the resources needed within that budget uh, to fulfill our statutory obligations, but probably not, not to go much beyond that. And it, it would, it's likely, and this is where I defer to Kristen, um, that the administration might need to pull back from a conversation beyond that, other than helping flesh out the understanding of, of what resources may be available within state government to support some of those actions already, as opposed to things that would be absolutely contracted services. 
Um, I'm not sure if it makes sense to, to have the full council meet to discuss that, but somehow we've got to gather all those ideas and then have folks start to do the work of sorting through them. I would offer to, to establish some set of priorities and, and questions that we would want answered. Um, and I, I do think that that work needs to move relatively quickly. The governor's budget was introduced last week. Uh, I expect in my role as ANR secretary to be asked into the, the House Appropriations Committee in the next one to two weeks to, to describe the budget and they will uh, work very quickly and aggressively over the, the next month to, to move that document forward. So there, there isn't a lot of time um, between now and, and when decisions will start to get made to, to assemble that information and, and to the extent uh, there is interest in putting together an ask that goes above the governor's recommend to forward that into the legislature. Thanks, Julie. Oh, no, Kristen, if you clarify or add to that at all. I, I don't have anything to add, Julie. I think that was um, I think that was perfect. I I will as I say that, then I add something. Um, I I think the only thing I would add is just to reiterate the point that with respect to um, proposals differing from or over and above what the governor has already proposed in his budget. I think folks from the administration would have to, um, you know, would have to bow out and recuse themselves from that. Those sorts of, um, if we're specifically voting on those sorts of recommendations. Thanks, Kristen. Okay, uh, Rich. Uh, two comments. I'm I'm in agreement with the uh, note in the chat that quarterly meetings at this point seem too infrequent for the amount of work that we're anticipating having to get through, uh, especially in the first half of this year. So I would I'd be more inclined to say every other month or uh, something along those lines. The second, as for funding eat for studies and funding for outreach and funding potentially to improve the compensation of uh, the council members and subcommittee uh, members. Um, here's a suggestion for a process. I think that I would break it down to three steps. The, I would hope that staff generally, including staff who are working closely with subcommittees, could just start making a list, and probably you've already done that, um, make a pretty good list of the, the funding needs that have been identified to date. Um, it would be great if the subcommittees could reflect upon those needs and maybe send some indication to the steering committee of their highest priorities. Uh, as a second step, I guess I would think it would be fine if the steering committee is tasked with the idea of coming up with a draft budget for activities that go beyond what the governor has already you know, indicated that the administration is supporting, as Julie just referred. And then third, that that recommendation from the steering committee be presented to the full council. Um, I recognize that if we're gonna get legislative action to make the funding available for the rest of this calendar year, we kind of need to work on those, through those three steps pretty quickly. Yeah, thanks Rich, seems pretty clear. Okay. So I'm conscious of time. I know we uh, we want to do public comment. We're getting to the top of the hour as well. So we're running a little bit late. Um, it sounds to me uh, that there's clearly an interest in working expeditiously on this funding issue so that you are able to say something in a time that's relevant. So that argues for the process that Rich said and that you all as a council being able to meet and be that final step in the process in a relatively timely way, right? And we can figure out with Jane what that means in terms of when. Um, in terms of other pieces going forward um, with this using the task group idea, 
the compensation issue is really challenging. We need to think about that. And we also need to think about the transparency issue and making sure that everybody can be clearly aware of what's going on uh, in during that part of the process. I'm not sure how to end this conversation without, you know, unless folks want to say, you know, what instruction do we really want to give to Jane and the steering committee um, in terms of setting a calendar of meetings for us going forward um, and addressing some of these challenges that you've brought up? Are there other pieces of instruction that you'd like to have clearly stated today as, uh, as we try to make some decisions on this? Is there anything else on this work plan that needs to be stated? Chris? Yeah, just briefly. I mean, um, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of good resources throughout the state where we can not necessarily formally through a six, uh, subcommittee or a, or, a, or a smaller group uh, necessarily bring people informally. But like we were talking the other day around uh, transportation issues. Um, each regional planning commission has uh, a professional transportation planner uh, to bring a lot of uh, experience to that kind of conversation. And yes, you know, so I'm happy like to tap into that community of folk uh, to bring thinking to that. Um, but we've got lots of other NGOs and other folk out there who we can tap into this. And I think that would be a critical part also of, of also, that's not, the same as broad public engagement, meaning just you know getting out to, um, to, to you know to as many Vermonters as possible, but we do have an opportunity to try to I think tap into a broader array of folk to bounce ideas and try to generate ideas and, and how to move forward on some of this stuff. So I just wanted to bring that up. Um, we've got the time now. We've got the you know and. I think it might also help uh, not just completely cook the minds of everybody who's already been engaged in this for the last year. Um, you know, it, it's an opportunity to try to bring more minds into it. So uh, just wanted to put that out there. Um, let's think creatively about how to get more people involved. And frankly, before we come even come back as a council to make final decisions uh, or subcommittees, let's figure out how to get it out to, you know, frontline communities, the folk identified uh, under just transitions principles to a full array of Vermonters and bounce ideas off of people, um, get out of our own, um, get out of our own boundaries to some extent and uh, and run some ideas by people and gather some ideas by some people. We, we don't have those, we don't have the, that, that clock ticking quite as loud anymore. Thanks, Chris, that's great. Okay, I think that's as far as we're gonna get on this conversation. I don't know, Jane, if that feels like enough input for us to be able to make some decisions and take those to the steering committee. Does that, does that seem right? Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's do this. Well, we're gonna start losing people right very quickly. So let's do some public comment here. If folks have been joining our meeting today and would like to make a comment, this is a great time to do that. I apologize, we're about 15 minutes behind our schedule today, but if folks have been joining us and would like to make some comments, this is a good time to do it. Feel free to raise your hand under the reactions button in, uh, in Zoom or jump in the chat um, or otherwise just wave and I'll, I'll see you. I see Emily Thompson, go ahead, Emily, please. Thanks. Hi. Thank you all so much for um, all the work that you're doing. And it sounds like you all are really low capacity. So um, yeah, thank you all just so much for how much work you're putting into this. I was just curious, this is my first um, council meeting I've been to. So apologies if this has been addressed before, but I would just be super curious to hear if anyone has um, a sort of response to there was a, an article written by Liz Medina in the digger uh, about two ish weeks ago week and a half ago um basically yeah advocating for more diversity in the council um and incorporating more diverse voices particularly BIPOC and working class voices and I know Abby in particular like brought that up earlier but I'm curious if um folks have more ideas a, a, about the specifics as well that were brought up in that article if, if anyone's read it Thanks, Emily, for bringing that up. 
And before we do any kind of reaction to that, I, I wonder if there's other comments um, that other folks who have joined us today would like to make. Thanks, um, thanks Emily for that comment. Um, before we finish up today, um, it's an opportunity if anybody wants to react to the issue of diversity in the groups. Um, it's something that's come up. I've heard, I think all the subcommittee members that spoke today or co-chairs that spoke today talked about composition of their subcommittees. Um, I know that, uh, Jane, this is something that in all the testimony that you provide to the legislature that you reiterate that it, the legislature has the opportunity in naming uh, counselors and others uh, to focus on this. If anybody else has anything else to say about it, feel free right now, counselors, before we finish up today. Emily, thanks for the question. I think um, some of the difficulty is at least from my experience as somebody who, you know, I don't make a living wage doing the work that I do on a daily basis. And so coming here is quite a commitment. Um, I don't think we've had any ability to have the questions answered as to how we will change that for folks moving forward. And so there's a part of me that's really hesitant. Um, so there's two pieces, right? There's the moving at the speed of trust. And I can tell you from trying to make, uh, to put together our subcommittee at the beginning of last year, there were a few people that decided that they couldn't participate after I spent about, you know, six to eight weeks going back and forth talking about it. Um, so that's a real factor here. I'm not sure how in this moment we functionally get around those types of barriers. Um, I think, and I also do feel I have to say that we, I don't think have done quite enough work as a council in understanding power and privilege and the ways in which different people can come to the table and that, um, in how some of the conversations are navigated, it's not necessarily, the spaces are not necessarily ready for those conversations to be held in ways that are safe for the folks that we most need to hear from. So those are some of the things that I'm currently grappling with as we're thinking about the next year. Um, I apologize, I don't have any more solid answers, but I think those are some of the realities that are sort of facing us as we're trying to think about how to do this work equitably and through the lens of a just transition. I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you. And thanks for your honest answers. Thanks. June, last word. Yeah, to Emily's point, um, I don't know that she's still with us or not, but I, I would just observe that under the statute, um, the cabinet positions are ex officio, meaning it's our offices that are assigned to the council, not the individuals necessarily. The appointments that are made by the legislators, Emily, are uh, individuals. They have to have a certain kind of background, but they're not uh, based on their offices. So your immediate course of action would be to look at the statute and see what the time limitations are on these terms, and then to have a conversation with the appointing authorities in the legislature about diversity. I think you can tell from the conversations this council's having that we're mindful of the issue that within the constraints that we face, which at this point are principally um, you know, budgetary in terms of being able to offer you know, fair compensation to people for their time to close the diversity gap that exists perhaps because the appointments aren't as diverse as one might wish. Although I have to say, you know, when you're looking for the combination of skill sets, diversity, uh, ability to make the time commitment and so forth, it's a very tall order. And uh, that's a long way of saying that the, the council itself is mindful of the need and open to suggestion that the most immediate path to doing something about this is to direct yourself to the legislature. Great. All right, folks, I think that brings us to the end of our time. And I apologize, we're about 10 minutes over. Um, anything else before we wind up today and finish up our meeting today?
Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody. And um, we'll be in touch in working through the steering committee to figure out um, the exact uh, frequency and next meeting. Stay tuned on that. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for, for a good first meeting in the year. It's nice to see everybody and work together. Take care and especially see Kelly's coworker there. <laughs> All right. See y'all later. Take care. <laughs>